have a seat. It's great to be back down here in Southern California. What some great training so far today, would you say? Yes. Oh my goodness. Everyone say, it's possible. It is possible. You know, you have everything you need to be successful. You already know. My passion and my mission to help you unleash your greatness within. My heart goes out to the underdogs. That, that's on our way. If you think you can, go from good to great. Okay, let's motivate. Greatness within Hoisington. Greatness within It's within reach, my friends. Your success is not determined on what side of town you grew up on. It's not determined by how much money you have in your bank account right now. Success is not based on your IQ level or your education. You are much more than your job. You're much more than your next sale. You're much more than your next recruit. You're much more than your past failures and mistakes. You are literally, everyone in this room, unstoppable. And accept that for yourself. You all come and have great worth. Each one of you in this room has a noble birthright. And all I say is unleash your greatness within. All I say is live. Live today. Live for real. Give the best that you can give. It's a beautiful thing to think that we live in a world that if you just apply a few laws, you can almost go from nothing and achieve something great. And everyone in here, each one of you, has the ability and the potential to do it. Everyone say, I'm unstoppable. A number of years ago, there was a snowstorm. It was a severe snowstorm in Utah. It drove all the deer that were in the higher country down to the lower area. There were a lot of fences down in the lower area, and it was a severe snowstorm. So capable, well-meaning people gathered as much hay as they could to put it down there where they could be warm and they could eat some food and hopefully be protected from this severe snowstorm. It's the best they could do under the circumstances. Unfortunately, when the storm surpassed, many of those deer passed away. They were concerned. When they did the autopsy, you know what they noticed? That all the deer's stomachs were full of hay, but that they had starved to death. In other words, my friends, they were fed, but they weren't nourished. My hope today in the few minutes that I have, that I've been entrusted to have humbly, to spend just a minute or two with you and remind you of your greatness that you already have within. I can't give you your greatness. You don't have to ask for it. You already have it. For 99% of everyone out there, it's a matter of discovering what you already have. And I hope in the few minutes that we're sharing together, that I could speak to your heart, that I can nourish your soul, with some key points that I found through my own life, through the ups and the downs, and through working with a lot of people over the years, to think that I've been doing this now for over 16 years, but I've been studying the personal development for 22, and to think that I've been out there doing it professionally, writing books and audio programs. I remember a time when I was just beginning, and I created from scratch, I was young, I created from scratch the Power to Shape Your Life CD sets, which is a six CD set, Every single CD was put together from scratch. I put those labels on myself. I went to do a seminar in Burley, Idaho, of all places. Did a little seminar there. The next day I was supposed to present, I had all the tapes in the back of the car, or the CDs in the back of the car. And we went to bed that night. And someone broke in my car that night and stole all those Power to Shape Your Life CDs. I hope someone got something good out of it, right? <laughs> 
But I tell you, I've been there where big failures happened and things just happened and didn't go right. So if you're one of those out there that wonder if you're really moving forward or if you're taking two steps back, listen, we have some common ground to share because I've seen it from both angles, fortunately and unfortunately. You each have greatness within you and my job today is just to remind you just a little bit about that greatness. I was 14 years old. It was the start of a summer. My dad came to my older brother Steve and I and he said, I'm going to get a job for you for the summer. You're not just going to sit around. I'm going to raise you into capable young men who know how to work and you're going to go get a job. What dad? It's summertime. This is the time to play. What do you mean we have to work? He goes, I'm going to find a job for you. And he did. The next week he said, you're to show up tomorrow at your new job. I said, where are we going to be working, Dad? He says, I won't tell you. Just put on your work clothes and I'll take you. They'll be waiting for you. Steve and I put on our work clothes and he drove us down in the town that we lived in to the local waste management company. <laughs> Literally. I said, Dad, how could you? You got us a job at a dump yard? And I remember he goes, a job is a job. Hmm. I wasn't very happy about it, but there was no choice. We got in the car, we drove down. He said, the foreman is right in that door. He'll be waiting for you. And the, we walked through the door. The foreman was there. He walked us in early in the morning to this big room where there were probably 20 other workers that had worked there for 20 years, all in their green uniforms, drinking their coffee, ready to start another day. And I remember here are two teenage boys, 14 and 15 years old, that walk in. And you know what? The foreman says, here's how you use a time clock. You punch in in the morning, you punch out during lunch and back in, and then you make sure you punch your time clock at the end of the day. If you don't do that, you'll mess it all up and it'll cause problems. So you want to make sure you make sure you punch in and punch out. Okay, sir, okay. And then he invited us to go with our supervisor for the day. Not knowing what we were going to do, the supervisor took us out the back door. Took us on a little ride out to about 20 acre pile of garbage. <laughs> I don't know, 50 feet high. At the top of this heap of garbage, there was a portable toilet. That was the one place we tried to get to. But you know what? They kept everyone 50 yards apart. They wouldn't let you talk to your coworkers or even my own brother. We're sitting there working. Our job responsibility was to pick out metal from all the trash and put it in a bag. I remember, my friends, picking out metal from diapers. It stunk. I remember as I was working, picking up metal, trying to fill up my bag. I would look over at Steve. And I would Steve, see Steve looking over at me like, there is no way I am going to keep doing this job. And I was thinking the same thing, no way. So we signaled each other, right? They wouldn't let us talk. So we signaled each other like, go to the bathroom. You go now, I go, in two minutes, I go up to the bathroom, and we're going to huddle, and we're going to make some serious decisions here. <laughs> so we did. We made our way up to that bathroom on the top of this pile of garbage. Oh, and it stunk. We get up there. I remember our supervisor's eyes were on us. I didn't care. Steve and I get up there, at the top of that heap of garbage, and Steve goes, there is no way I'm going to continue working here. I said, I agree with you. He says, but what do you think dad's going to say? I don't care what dad says. <laughs> Steve goes, okay, we're going to go into the first break and we're going to quit. <laughs> I said, Steve, you're a better communicator than me. You're older than me. I always leaned on you for communication. You got to be the spokesperson. Steve goes, I will, because I'm not working another day in this dump yard. So break comes, all the workers, the men that have been there for 15, 20 years, were sitting there drinking their coffee and here come these two little teenagers, new on the job, walking in. After a few minutes of scanning our situation, right, 
we decided to tell the foreman. We said, Mr. Foreman, my brother and I have discussed a few things. <laughs> and this is literally what he said. And we've decided to retire. <laughs> You laugh. You laugh. And so did the other 20 men in that room. They all laughed at us like, oh my goodness. We quit. He said, well, the payphone is over there. You better call your dad to pick you up. We called dad, pick us up. He goes, why are you done so early? He goes, oh, they didn't have a lot of work for us to do. <laughs> Just come and pick us up. My dad was always cool, though. He pulled up in the car. Why are you guys done so early? What happened? We resigned. We quit. You quit. Hoisingtons don't quit. Dad, we quit. And we went on and life went on. Here's what I noticed, and I'm not trying to demean those types of jobs, those types of workers, because they are necessary. We need them in our communities. We need them in our country. There is nothing wrong, inherently wrong, with those jobs. That is not my point. I work with frontline workers of all types of organizations all around the country and even the world. And I tell you, these people are good people. They work hard. They have attitudes that want to serve their families and do what's right for those that they love. There's nothing wrong with it. But I knew for me, standing in there, that was not my future. And there might be just some of you in here that have decided that that's not your future either. And here's what I started from that point as a 14 year old. I started to look at people differently. I started to look at, well, what does it that separates the high achievers from the lower achievers? I saw short people that were successful and tall people that were successful. Hmm. I saw honest people that were successful and I saw dishonest people that were successful. What could be the difference? I saw people that were driving nice cars only to find out later it was the person that was driving the clunker that had a greater net worth. It's a big difference. I thought, what are the actual differences? It can't be where you grew up. It can't be, you know, what kind of a background you have. That is not enough to determine success. And then through research and through life, of learning a few things on my own, I learned that success comes down to laws. And I want to share some laws with you today. If you remember, some of you have already read If You Think You Can. So the subtitle of If You Think You Can is 13 laws that govern the performance of high achievers. Every time I have worked with people or myself when I haven't succeeded like I should have, I have realized that it's always come down to a missing one or two of those 13 laws. Every time. There's one law I didn't include in that book, which will be a future book. I'll give you a heads up. It's the 14th law. And that is that no success can compensate for failure in the home. And that's not me who said it. It was a religious leader some time back that said no success can compensate for failure in the home. It's a balanced approach. But those 13 laws really do matter in terms of whether you succeed or whether you don't. Let me just give you a couple simple ones real quick. Here's what I've learned. Success is not a respecter of person. It's a respecter of disciplines. Success is not a respecter of persons, individuals, as much as it's a respecter of disciplines. The daily, simple, repeated disciplines over time eventually have a compounding effect. Here's another law that I've since learned. And that law is very simple. All blessings or rewards in life are predicated on laws. You can argue that gravity isn't real until you fall off that cliff or you step off that building. You can fight it all you want, but there are seasons that work in time. We live in a culture that wants to go from planting the seed 
to jumping to the harvest. You hear what I'm saying? And we're forgetting that middle part, which is cultivation. It's the law of the harvest. You plant the seed, you reap what you sow through planting the seed, cultivating the seed, and then harvesting. You want to make sure that you don't miss one of those crucial laws that will lead to success. You can't skip. You can't skip the sun. You can't skip the water. You can't skip, my friends, the nourishment. And so I wanted to share with you today four other laws that will be vital to your success, as I've seen over and over. And the first law is master your thinking. In other words, you must learn to think like a high achiever. So what does that look like? How does a high achiever think? Very simple. A high achiever believes that they can do it. A high achiever believes that they're capable to do anything, to go anywhere, to be anything they want to be. They take 100% responsibility for every aspect of their life. They have a can-do attitude. They don't focus on why things can't be done. They focus on why things can be done. And then they creatively maneuver to find out a way to make that a reality. Those that are successful think like a high achiever in that they will adapt. They will adjust. They will reflect on where they've come from and how they're performing today. And if it's not working, they will change. I call it an AOS. Achievers operating system. You know with your mobile devices, your tablets, your computer at home, that every once in a while you must upgrade that operating system. Right? Here's the reality. You've got to regularly upgrade that operating system that's inside your head. Because if you don't, then your thinking will take charge over you instead of you over your thinking. And at the base level, the thinking can be negative. You'll find yourself saying negative things. You'll start to doubt yourself. And then you'll start talking yourself out of your goals, out of your dreams, out of this business. You'll creatively find evidence in your world because you'll start changing your focus because of what you're thinking on and dwelling on. You'll find the evidence that says, this won't work. But you can equally find the same evidence to say why something will work. It's a, it's a matter of focus. What are you focused on? Are you focused on what can happen or are you focused on what can happen?